go. So everyone, let's um, let's lay aside the issues and affairs that we're all having to contend with, and uh, let's focus on the Lord as we open up in prayer. Father God, we we bless your name. We thank you for uh, your word, which is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. We thank you, Lord, not only that we are people of faith, but we are people of hope, Lord. And uh, we hope in you. We hope that you will move on our behalf. We hope that you will fulfill your word. And Lord, our hope is like an anchor, uh, sure and steadfast. And our hope is not based on our feelings, but it's based on your word. And so Lord, thank you that the hope that we have is uh, a, a secure hope. And we thank you that Yeshua, Jesus, he is our hope, Christ in us, the hope of glory. One day, Lord, where you will take us up to be with you forever in glory. And as the scripture says, death will be swallowed up. And uh, thank you, Lord, for the, the resurrection power and that we, uh, you who are the first fruits from those among the dead, we will join you, Lord in resurrection and we will all have a resurrected body so lord in the meantime help us with these bodies that we have whether it's early in the morning whether it's in the afternoon or evening lord strengthen us quicken us by your word in yeshua jesus our lord's name we ask amen 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 well, everyone, um, I feel kind of a little lonely here without Liz, John. I mean, you know, <laughs> me too. <laughs> yeah, it's like I'm all, I feel a bit vulnerable here. But anyhow, um, guys, we're carrying on our study of the survival of the church. And uh, yeah, if you are, if you're not muted, please mute yourself. Um, and uh, so, yes, the, the theme, the survival of the church, our standing and the fulfilling of our calling. And today I want to talk about walking in our gifting and in our calling, walking in our gifting and in our calling. Um, it, uh, it may be something you senior uh, believers might think is uh, something, you know, that you've done for many years. Um, but it's something I think that is so important to be aware of. And it's actually extremely healthy for us all to know our gifting, to know our calling and to walk in it. Do you remember when we looked at the conversion of the Apostle Paul and how Ananias laid hands on him and uh, said, receive your sight. And um, then he was introduced to others in the church. And then Barnabas came alongside uh, Paul, and then Timothy, and others. And, um, you know, Paul, and of course, when the Lord on the road to D Damascus said, why do you persecute me? Well, Paul wasn't persecuting Jesus, was he? He was, he was persecuting the church. But the Lord took it very personally and said, why are you persecuting me? So he identifies him with his body, which is us. And, um, and how Paul instantly received that revelation of the body and how Ananias laid hands on him. And then if you look, interestingly, Paul's ministry, really, that was his call to the church, to build up the church, to edify the church, to father the church, 
to strengthen the church. And, um, you know, really, in a way, that's the great commission that the Lord left us when he said, go into all the world, number one, preach the gospel, and number two, make disciples of all nations. And so evangelism and discipleship, um, you know, evangelism in a way is the easy part. It's like having children, but then when you have that baby in your arms, it's like, wow, for the next 18, 19, 20 years, it's like I've got to raise that child. And that's the business that you are, and I are in, of raising children, to being dis uh, not only being discipled, but to raise other disciples and help other disciples. Um, <clears throat> have any of you heard of a, a well-known Christian author from the United States, Dr. Larry Crabb? Uh, he is a Christian psychologist, and he has many books. And uh, I would say one of the you know top three books that I think I've ever read in my life was one of his books called Connecting. And uh, Dr. Crabb talks about how for many, many, many years, decades, he would counsel people. He would spend hours listening to their background, listening to their story, and then he would try and find some help and solution. But he came to a new realization in his ministry that um, what actually helped people more than anything was helping to connect them within the body, within their lifestyle, finding out who they are and what their giftings and talents are and try to nurture them in that right location. Connecting people. And um, I don't know if you've ever been in a, in a church where the pastor or the preacher or the leaders are up on the stage and you're sitting down in the pew and uh, they're up there and you're down there and you kind of, uh, and even after and before the service, you know, you're, you're just sitting, you're not really connected. There's a gap there. And uh, it takes a lot of skill for leaders um, and hosts you know, even are you aware that being a doorman or a door woman at a church is a really important role? You know, the way they greet you, you know, they can be cold or they can be so warm, they can be, uh, they can put it on or they can be really genuine. And that can actually make a huge difference how people actually welcome you into the church. It, it connects you to the body. After all, you know, what happens if you, uh, you know, by accident, your finger or your toe gets cut off? Uh, the, the, the best thing to do is straight away try to re reattach that to your body. Otherwise, uh, it's, it's going to go dead. And so I think this is a really serious point and i haven't got time to go into his whole book but um you know the idea of connecting are you connected last week we talked about the church talked about paul are you do you feel connected to a church maybe you've been uh at the same congregation for many years and that's great if you've been able to successfully uh um you know, carry on. Uh, hang on, I'm just getting a uh, someone wanting to come into the meeting. And I don't see anyone in the waiting room. So I don't know why they've just asked me to connect them in. In any event, I'll keep my eyes open for that. Um, no. uh, so the, 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 this, this, Thought, this idea of being connected. You know, sometimes people these days, they feel more connected being in a uh, WhatsApp group, and that is their congregation. That is their church these days. 
Um, that's a way of connecting. I'm, I know it's a little bit uh, uh, virtual. It's not in person, but uh, some people feel more connected than actually being in uh, person. So that's quite a uh, quite a challenge. Um, why is Missy? Yeah, I'm sorry, everyone. I'm, I've just got a, a an email from Missy saying she can't get into the Bible study. Uh, does anyone here know Missy, Hal and Missy? If you do, if you could please uh, send them a, uh, a link with the um, with the Zoom link, and uh, we can get them on board. Uh, let me, in the meantime, uh, do something here. Let me copy and paste the, the link. And uh, I'll, I'll try and quickly do that. Excuse me, everyone, while I do that. This is, this is really where we need Liz because she's a woman and she can multitask. I'm not good at that. <laughs> okay, here we go. Uh, reply and copy and paste. You know how men multitask? Men What's do that you know how men multitask? We Al. do something once and take credit for it three times. <laughs> oh yeah, I like that. <laughs> Typical men, I know. So everyone, um, let's uh, let's go to the um, our notes. And by the way, to keep things in perspective, what we're talking about about our giftings, our talents, and being connected. Really, what we're talking about is building God's kingdom. In the Old Testament, the Tanakh, the pattern is, of course, the tabernacle and the temple. That was God's house. That's where God dwelt. And so there were instructions. There was not just individual, but corporate building together when they made the tabernacle, when they made the, the temple. If you read 1 Kings 5, you see what uh, the wisdom that Solomon got, number one. Number two, he got help from a man called Hiram or Hiram, the man from Tyre, which is today's Lebanon. And he sent all the wood and the stonemasons. He even got materials from Egypt that came in through uh, Eilat. And then if you look in Exodus 31, there was a man called Bitzalel. And it says that he was, let me read in Exodus 31. It says, now Bitzalel, I have chosen Bitzalel. And I have filled him with the spirit of God, with wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge, with all kinds of skills to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood, to engage in all kinds of crafts. So guys, that was in the physical. They were building a physical temple or a tabernacle. But our kingdom, see, this is the difference. The kingdom that we're building is an unseen kingdom. We are sowing spiritual seed incorruptible seed. Now, I know that there are physical things that we need to do, but I'm talking about the, the gifts that we have. They're called in the scriptures, gifts of the spirit, given to us by the spirit. And, um, and you know, there's no one path here. There's no rigid, this is it, and that's it. You know, it's like um, some people, like Billy Graham, for example, I mean, he's a real, he was a real out and out evangelist. We all know that. That was his office. But I'm sure there were times that he gave pastoral care. I'm sure that there were times that he became a teacher, that he became a preacher, that he did other things. So we can move and operate in things that we don't necessarily have an, an office in. 
But I think, I do believe that we all have a special talent. It's like I gave the analogy last week of being in a sports team. You know, you're, when you're in a sports team, you're part of a team, but you have your own quality, individual personality and gift and talent. You may not be good on attack, but you might be good on de defense and vice versa. Um, today, I want us to look in Matthew 25 at the well-known parable of the talents. So if you've got your, your, your notes or your, um, or your Bible, and I'm not seeing that uh, Missy and Hal are with us. Huh. I wonder why. And... Um, they're not in the waiting room. There's a waiting room for people that want to get in, but I don't see them here. You all are my witnesses of that, okay? <laughs> so, um, I'm confused why. This is unusual uh, why that's the case. So while you're getting your Bibles, let me just quickly respond to them and ask why. All right, I sent it to them again. So this is the last chance. I hope and pray that they make it. So everyone, the parable of the talents. This is a parable. In fact, in this chapter, it's, you know how I always say context is important? In this chapter, the Lord gives two stories. One is the story of the wise and the foolish virgins. And then he goes straight into the parable of the talents. And they're actually both connected. In, in Matthew 25, verse 14, the Lord says, again, he begins again, and he carries on from the parable of the wise and the foolish virgins. Both of these parables are teaching about the kingdom of heaven, okay? Building up God's kingdom from heaven on the earth, the kingdom of God. Now, it talks about the, a man, and that man is representative of the Lord, our Lord Yeshua, who became. Uh, who, when God, Emmanuel, became uh, a man in the flesh, came to the earth. Verse 14, again, it will be like a man going on a journey. And that's the picture of our Lord. He came to the earth. He's gone on a long journey. He is seated in the heavens. And uh, then it says that he called his servants and entrusted his wealth in. Guys, you and I, we are the servants. So in these two parables, there's virgins and there's servants. And the virgins are sig uh, signifying how we live and clean up our lives. That parable is all about virgins, wise and foolish. And that talks about the need for us to live a life of sanctification. You know, someone, actually many people have asked me over the years, um, you know, if we have salvation, why really should, should we, do we need to concentrate on being sanctified? Isn't it enough that we will just get to heaven the way we are? It's a big topic, the topic of sanctification. But uh, one of the... Um, among many one of the answers is simply you know in a relationship if you if you have a marriage marriage or a relationship with someone you don't want to do something that you know is going to hurt the relationship and uh we want to be pleasing to the lord so that's the parable of the virgins living a life pleasing to the lord and secondly the uh, slaves here in this parable are symbolic of uh, how we serve the Lord. Today, we're going to focus on how we're 
serving the Lord and still no uh, mercy or hell. Um, I don't know what happened. Um, if you actually look in verse 13, in between the two parables, what does the Lord say? Therefore, keep watch, because you don't know the, hour, the day or the hour that this either bridegroom or master is coming. So really, this is to be prepared. This is to be on guard. This is another way of blasting the shofar, sounding the trumpet, everyone. This is what the Lord is doing by giving us these two parables. He is blowing the shofar. He wants to wake us up. You know, the foolish virgins, they're still virgins, but they are foolish. They don't have enough oil in their lamps. And you and I know even days, hours that we go when we're not filled, when we're not spending time in communion with the Lord. You know how that feels, right? You just know that you, you lose your cutting edge. Life is more difficult. It's more challenging. The, the, the attacks seem to come more thicker. You're not hearing from the Lord. I got, a, I got a new insight this week. I was doing a study on, I'm doing a study on one Kings. And remember the story where Solomon had a dream. And in the dream, the Lord said to him, ask whatever you want. And Solomon asked for one thing. He asked for a wise and discerning heart. And, uh, and of course, the Lord said, not only, uh, he said, because you didn't ask for riches, gold, fame, and all that, I'm going to give you that as well as a discerning heart. Good choice for Solomon. But I wanted to know what the Hebrew is for a wise and discerning heart. And I, it, I was shocked. The, it's two words. It's, and, and maybe you can learn these two words. The first word is lev, and the second word is shomer, from the word shema, shema Yisrael. Lev means a heart. Shomer means a listening. So literally what Solomon prayed for was a listening heart. That's the literal Hebrew. In the, in the English, it's a wise and discerning heart. Now, what that leads to the question, what's a listening heart? And I've said this a number of times, you know, the rabbis say with every verse is on average four to six different interpretations. But I want you to think about that, a listening heart. And um, I was talking about when we've got our lamps filled with oil, isn't it so much easier to hear what the spirit is saying, to just get to be more discerning, to have more light, so to speak. It's kind of like the picture of the tabernacle or the temple. The closer you get to the Lord, the more light there is. There's the light in the outer court, the natural light. Then there's the seven branch menorah in the holy place. But then there is this amazing Shekinah glory light as we get closer into the holy of holies. So, Let's go back to the parable. The man is Christ. The servants are us. We're told to be on guard, kind of um, like the people in the days of Nehemiah who built with one hand and they had their swords in their other hands. So verse 14, for the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered goods to them. So guys, what are these goods that's talking about? Uh, some other translations, it says, he entrusted wealth to them. Don't know what your uh, translation uh, says. Uh, possessions. These are often interpreted as gifts to the church. Or to put it in another way, what did the Lord say to Peter in Matthew 16, behold, I give you keys to the kingdom. Wow. 
This is a fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 22, verse 22, which says, and to him, I will give the key of the house of David and whatever he opens, no man can close and whatever he closes, no man can open. We have been given keys. And I believe the more we study God's word, the more keys we get, the more revelation, the more enlightened we become. So this should more and more uh, create in us a greater hunger to be in God's word, to study deep God's word, because we get more keys. And it's not about us being empowered. It's not a, about us becoming, as Paul calls them, these super apostles. And by the way, he says that, he uses that quote, these super apostles, in a kind of sarcastic way. It's not about us being, it's about us being equipped to do the work of the Lord. Remember, uh, two weeks ago, I talked about the key word is imparting. The Lord imparts to us so that we can impart to others. And here this man is imparting uh, special talents to his servants. And by the way, that was a common thing. When a, when a master was going away, he would entrust to his servants money. Usually it was money. And so there's risk. There's a risk here for the, for the master to do that. After all, the servants can steal it, misuse it, um, abuse it, uh, and never be seen again. So um, the idea of being entrusted is a sense of privilege. Privilege. We are all privileged with these gifts that the Lord has given us. Um, verse, uh, and, and let me just say also, when it comes to these keys that we're given and this revelation that's given us, guys, this is the seed. These, our gifts and our talents, our natural gifts and talents are connected with God's word. I believe the more mature we are in God's word, the more that God will enlarge our borders. He will open doors for us. Uh, after all, I mean, if we're limited in the knowledge of God, then I guess we're limited in what we can say about God. So the more uh, we know and the more in depth, and, uh, and that's an exciting thing. And we're going to find out why as we go into this, um, this parable. So uh, in verses 16 and 17, Look what it says. The man who had received five bags of gold. This is the NIV, by the way. I usually am a King James man, but I'm going to NIV today. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once, at once, it says, and put his money to work and gave five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. So one key point here is how they at once went and put their hand to the plow. I think that's an important part uh, in the story. They didn't wait. They went and used their gift at once. And of course, as I mentioned, money lending in those days was a common thing. And that's usually what they would do with the money that the master would leave. They would lend money. And sometimes the interest was very, very good. It was sometimes they would get five or even 10 times more. If you look in Luke 19 at the parable of the miners, where their interest was uh, amazingly uh, good. And one other point to bring out, look at, go back to verse 15. At the end, it says, to one he gave five, to another two, and, and to another one, each according to his ability. Let me say that again, each according to his ability. So I think there are two things here. I think there are, is one, there is the gifts of the spirit. And then number two, I think we all have natural ability, just natural ability. For example, if you go back to the Garden of Eden, remember where 
uh, Adam, he, he was told to name the animals. And whatever he named them, that is what they were. Have you ever wondered, have you ever used your imagination? Have you ever thought of looking down at Adam, seeing all these creatures that God created, and then he, looking at him, giving them their names? I mean, I wonder where did these names come from? Did Adam, were they downloaded to Adam? Like cow, pig, horse, snake. Kiwi, kangaroo, koala bear, uh, polar bear. How, where did he get these names from? I mean, did he or did he just blab them out? Uh, bear, snake, uh, kiwi. Where did they come from? Were they downloaded by the Holy Spirit or did he just get it from within himself? It's an interesting question and and food for thought if anyone's got any thoughts on that um i'm interested to know <laughs> but uh the point is is that they all did according to their natural ability so we all have natural talents but we also have spiritual gifts and we'll go to that in a minute so um and, and by the way, can I just make one more comment on that? It's okay with our natural uh, talents. Um, you know, in Judaism, uh, a lot of the commandments that were given at Sinai were not only given on an individual level, they were actually given to be used in a community setting. Because it's in a community setting, the place for discipline and for tradition is very strong in community, okay? Especially in the Israelite community. Now, we all know that that can become rote, become legalistic, and become stale and dead. But there is a place for discipline. There is a place for rote. There is a place for tradition. And it's up to you and me to find the balance to know when to carry on a tradition, when to carry on in our own natural ability with, our, with discipline, and to also, you know, live shomer, to have a, a hearing heart like Solomon, a wise and discerning heart, to know, okay, you know what? I'm done with this. My kids are done with this tradition. You know, my, my parents, they used it for 10, 20 years. It's done. That time is over. It's time to move on. So um, uh, we need wisdom to know, uh, like Solomon. Uh, in verse 19, look what it says. After a long time, the master of those servants returned to settle accounts with them. Guys, who's this talking about? This is talking about the Lord when he comes back. Okay, And by the way, I think 70% of the parables are about the return of the Lord. This is a very important doctrine in the scriptures and of course living 2000 years ago i would imagine that they'd be waiting any second any minute any day any week we we've we've got 2000 years behind us there's the danger of thinking hey he's been 2000 years maybe he'll be another thousand years and we take our foot off the gas no no god we gotta keep we gotta live on the edge we gotta live in this intensity Maybe some of you might disagree with me there. I just know that uh, when I'm not living in, 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 in that intensity that I'm talking about, my flesh will take over because my flesh is intense, right? All of our flesh wants to, it said, Paul says uh, the, that our flesh battles with the spirit. 
And so we, you know, I think it's, a, it's very important to live in that uh, intensity and living as if the Lord can come at any moment. And because when he comes, he's going to come to settle accounts, everyone. He's coming to as the judge. This is another characteristic of our Lord. Yes, he's our savior. Yes, he's our friend. But he is also our judge. He didn't come the first time to judge. He came to save. But this shows us that he's coming back to uh, judge and to settle accounts. And we're going to see that, uh, look at, uh, um, uh, well, basically, uh, if, you were, uh, if you were diligent, but if you were not, then there would be different consequences. Now look at verse 21. And uh, actually, let's, let's read um, from verse 19. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I've gained five more. Now look at the master's response. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and enter the joy of the Lord or your master's happiness. Verse 22, the same thing. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I've gained two more. And uh, the same response is master by well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Uh, enter into the joy of the Lord. Guys, how important these verses are psychologically and spiritually for us. What is it saying? It's saying that when you and I are using our talents and not burying them, that means our consciences are in the light. We are walking in the light and we have a sense of uh, we are pleasing to our master. And I think really there's two things that the Lord is looking for. He's not looking for fruit. He wants to know, are we good and are we faithful? at what we do with our talents, because that was the response. Well done, good and faithful servant. And uh, we can only do our best. Are we good at what we do? And are we faithful at what we do? Now, the third man, let's look in verse 24. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came, Master, he said, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. So let's, before we look at the master's response, let's look at this man, the man who buried his talent. Um, in a way, he's really insulting his master. And why do I say he's insulting his master? Because maybe he was in a derogatory way saying, you've only given me one. These guys got two. These guys got five. And maybe he was comparing his talent with the others. And maybe he wasn't happy. with. The, and maybe this was a test. This was a test for this man. Maybe the master deliberately only gave him one talent to see if he would put to use that one talent. And maybe in his own eyes, he's thought, this is small. This is a, this is a nothing talent. And maybe it's a test. And, and, and we can be tested in those ways as well. We see others with a singing talent, uh, with a dancing talent. And uh, we wonder, well, I wish I had that. I only have this talent. I have a, I have a gift of 
serving tea and coffee in the kitchen at the church in the church kitchen. Well, let me tell you, once you start to compare uh, or je jealousy uh, uh, um, rises up, you're on not on good ground. God wants you to you to to use what you've got. So number one, maybe he was insulting the master. Um, maybe actually not maybe obviously he had a wrong concept of the master look what he said he said in verse um 24 i knew you were a hard man harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered making it hard deliberately making it hard he was saying to the master i knew you were a hard man making it difficult even if i sowed it wasn't guaranteed that i was going to reap so uh wrong concept of the gift wrong concept of the master and you know we can speculate and say maybe the guy was insecure maybe he was afraid of taking that step maybe by lending money to someone he might have thought that person might do a runner on me and uh, run away with the money and um, I'm going to be indebted because I'm the one that's lending the money. I don't know. Uh, we can speculate. Maybe, in, in other words, I'm saying maybe he was afraid with that gift, which was that talent, to lend it out to someone because of fear, of insecurity. We, we don't know much more um maybe he had lack of confidence maybe he had lack of experience maybe he was too passive and maybe he thought it was safer burying it in the ground okay so in any event what is the lord's or the master's response in verses 26 27 his master replied you wicked lay wicked and lazy wow pretty pretty heavy uh words you wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I harvest where I've not sown and gather where I've not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. It's like he's got no excuse. It's like he's saying, really, your assessment of me is this? And he said, what you should have done, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers. So verse 28, so take the bag of gold from him and give it to one who has 10 bags. For, who have, for whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. And whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, which is a picture of regret. That's what that phrase means. Weeping and gnashing of teeth, a sense of regret. If only, you know, I should have. And that, that's a common phrase in Second Temple period literature. But uh, here, here we go with one of these principles, spiritual principles of God. To whoever, who, to whoever has, it will be given more. But to him who has, even that will be taken away. It's one of these ones where the Lord spins your mind out. Remember that proverb? There's a proverb, and I forget where it, go, where it is, but it's, it goes like this. It says, he that scatters increases, and he that withholds tends to poverty. Okay, that's, that's reverse wisdom or reverse Ration, ra rationality let me say it again he who scatters increases and he who withholds tends to poverty if someone can find that proverb and put it up please but uh isn't that interesting and and let me tell you here is a key thing in this parable it's the it's the word risk the word risk Are you aware that pretty much everything we do in life is a risk? 
you know, uh, every friendship, marriage, a business deal. When you go to the shop and buy something, you know, when you're going in the fruit shop and you're feeling the fruit, is it too hard? Is it too soft? Everything is a risk. Am I making the right decision? The shoes, are they going to be comfortable enough? What about after I use it? Thank you, DD Proverbs 1124. Uh, you know, maybe my shoes, when I buy shoes, you know, you get that feel, will, will, I, will they be comfortable after the first, the second time that I wear them? Uh, are my feet going to swell? Are they going to expand? And everything is, is or buying a car, uh, you know, is the air conditioner, is it going to be too, this, is it going to be comfortable? There's risk in, in decisions we make. That's a, that's a, a no-brainer. We, we all know. In everything we do, the the risk, the element of risk. Of course, of course, the the more talents we have, the more we will reap. But there's the greater risk. You know, let's just say, for example, um, you know, the Cubs were playing the are playing the White Sox, okay, in in Chicago, and. Um, you know, let's say you're a gambling man, which none of us are, but let's say, and um, I say to you, I'm going to bet for the White Sox. And you say, no, I'm going for the Cubs. And we say, okay, uh, $1. Let's do a bet for $1. $1 is nothing. It's easy. If I lose, it's no big deal. But if I say, okay, $1,000, you know, it's like, wow, I don't know. I'm convinced when it's one sh $1, but Am I, am I now convinced when it's $1,000? Why? What, what's happened? What's changed? If I'm adamantly convinced at $1, why aren't I adamantly convinced at $1,000? Because of that risk. There's always that risk. So this is part of life, I guess. And, um, and that's why I guess we, you know, with everything, with prayer, with supplication, sometimes with counsel, etc. cetera. Um, so our Lord come, is, he, 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 he entrusted these servants with, or rather this master entrusted these servants with these talents, came back on the day of reckoning, was happy with some, rewarded them, but with others uh, or with this one man, uh, he was pretty angry, he was pretty upset with this man's behavior. And, and I don't think it was actually so much his behavior. I think it was his attitude and his belief. The belief about the talent and the belief about his master. And again, I, I'm almost suspecting that it was like almost like a test only giving him one. And I think maybe the Lord or the master wanted to see how First, he would handle one. And if he was successful with one, then he was going to promote him. And the next time he's going to go away, he's going to give him five or he's going to give 10. And, and I do believe that that's scriptural, that as we mature, as we grow, then the Lord entrusts us with more. But again, there's more responsibility and there's more risk. But this, what I'm talking about now, is part of our discipleship. Because if you look at the disciples, you know, the Lord invested himself into the disciples for three years. When you think about it, he didn't actually tell them to do a lot in those three years. He did most of the work. He did the miracles. He fed the crowds. Sometimes he wanted to teach them uh, on site and he asked them to do things. But for the most part, he did it. And uh, they were witnesses. And uh, then he told them to do what he says. But he invested in their lives. That was a very rabbinical way of investing in disciples by leading by example. Moses, remember Moses was in the wilderness for 40 years? What was he doing in the wilderness for 40 years? Wasn't he God's chosen person for 40 years? Well, Moses didn't know but he was going to actually lead the Israelites for 40 years in the wilderness. But God had to put him in the wilderness for 40 years 
so that Moses would learn how to survive in the wilderness for 40 years if he was going to be the leader to lead the people in the wilderness for 40 years. God knows what he's doing. He, we, we think that we're being forgotten or we're lost or we're in a wilderness. But actually, if, if you have peace and you know that you're in the right place, even though it may be the most remote, loneliest, forsaken, God has a purpose. He's investing in your life. He's sowing into your life, especially his word. Uh, Joseph, remember all those years that Joseph was in prison? Don't think that those years were, uh, you know, that man was in control. God was in control of all of that, you know? And by the way, that gift that Joseph had was actually, uh, I think it was in interpreting dreams. Because when he first got those dreams that his brothers and father would bow down to him, uh, he took those dreams and he told his family, maybe it was a little bit overconfident the way he said it, but it was that same gift and talent that saved Egypt. Because when Pharaoh had a dream, all the soothsayers and all the magicians and the wise men, no one could interpret it. But Joseph, who previously in prison had interpreted the dreams for the baker and the butcher, that got him promotion, everyone. And there is a real big lesson. Joseph was in prison and his dreams were shattered. Right? Remember? Why else was he in prison? His dreams were shattered. And along came a test where these. The butcher and the baker had dreams. And Joseph could have thought to himself and sulked and felt sorry and thought, I'm not going to ever interpret dreams again. It got me in trouble. My brothers forsook me. I'm no way am I going to use that gift again. He could have buried his talent in the sand right there in the prison. But what did he do? He told the, the, the two, in three days, you're going to you know, be released. And the other one, in three days, you're going to be hung. And they were fulfilled. And the one that was released later on, when he, when he heard that no one could interpret Pharaoh's dreams, he, he remembered Joseph. He remembered him. And uh, Joseph was sent for, and Joseph came, he, and, and he interpreted, and he, he accredited his interpretations to God. And that's what not only so saved Joseph, but it saved his brothers, and it saved the world. Joseph became the savior. Guys, don't underestimate what your gift and talent can do for God and for his kingdom. Would Joseph have ever imagined that his gift, which at the beginning was a failure in his eyes, got him in trouble, would actually turn out to be for the salvation of the world. It's incredible. It's mind-boggling. And God had perfect timing because it says that Joseph was released from prison at the age of 30. And 30 is the age of priesthood. He was two more years because the man who was released, he forgot Joseph, but God hadn't forgot him. And it says that the Lord was with Joseph in prison. So guys, never underestimate how important your gifting is. What about David's gift, the harp? You know, at times when Saul had that evil spirit and David was able to use it to soothe that evil spirit. You know, sometimes we might have a gift, but we don't have the character. You know, it's like Samson. Samson was an incredibly gifted man you know he he had a, he had a supernatural strength but look at his character and it got him into big trouble god sometimes has to work on our character before he promotes look at galatians 1 look how long paul remember paul who murdered the believers wreaking havoc on the church 
Look what he says in Galatians 1, after he, his eyes were opened. It says, then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him 15 days. I saw none of the apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God that what I'm writing to you is no lie. Then I went to Syria and Sicilia. I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report. The man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they praise God because of me. Then, after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. I went in response to a revelation and meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders. I presented to them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. I wanted to be sure I was not running and had not been running my race in vain. Guys, the way that God works on our character, which is the parable of the virgins, the need to get oil and to prepare ourselves as a bride waiting for her bridegroom. <clears throat> and um, the, the, the years, the months, the years, the sometimes decades of being out in the, in the desert like Moses. It's not in vain. God has a purpose. I think Billy Graham, it was, was asked uh, when he was like in his 80s or something like that, if you had to turn the clock back, uh, what would you change in all your years of ministry? And he answered, I would spend a lot more time in preparation. Now, that was a man who that we all know had an incredible gift. So what is he saying by that? Uh, well, maybe one day when we get to heaven, we can ask a Billy, what did you mean? Uh, spend more time in preparation. Friends, God has given each one of us a gift. He has entrusted us at least one gift, at least Look in Ephesians 4, it's in your notes, Ephesians 4 from verse 7 to 13, this is what Paul said about gifts. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean? Except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions. He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole earth, uh, universe. So Christ himself gave to the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service. Now notice notice what, why, why Paul says he gave these gifts. Number one, to equip the people for works so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That's a lot. That is a lot in there. And then in Romans 12, look what Paul says, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each one of us has one body with mem many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to us. If your gift is prophesying, prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. And if it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Have you ever noticed one of the gifts is to have mercy? Do you have a gift of mercy? Do you have a gift of giving? Do you have a gift of encouragement? And then there's the, the gifts of the spirit, the, the, the gift of wisdom. 
the gift of knowledge. These are the spiritual gifts, the ones that come down from the throne room of God, the gift of faith, the gift of healing. I know one lady goes to our prayer for Israel meeting. She has a real gift of healing. You, ju you can just see when she prays for sick people. Now, I can pray for people that are sick, but I wouldn't say I have that really strong, uh, strong gift in praying, but I, I do. But there are people, they have a real outstanding gift in that area. The gift of miracles, the gift of prophecy, the gift of discerning spirits, the gift of tongues, the gift of interpreting tongues, the gift of administration, John, would you say Liz has a gift of administration? Yeah. Uh, and, and some of these gifts that I've read out, I mean, as I read them, some of them I think, man, I'm pathetic at some of these things. I'm so weak. And this is why we need to embrace and appreciate the body and be connected and ask that the Lord connects us so that we can function as a healthy body so may the lord in these days for the survival of the church and our standing and fulfilling our calling may we all know the gifting and the calling that we have may it become more and more crystallized in our lives but may we be open that the lord the holy spirit may move in our lives and we may move out of our comfort zone and we may get tested where the Lord actually gives us an opportunity to actually pray for someone or to do a, 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 a miraculous something. And it might actually be out of our comfort zone. Let's be open to that. But guys, in, 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 uh, to end, um, let's not forget what Paul said to the church at Corinth who were so taken up with the gifts of the spirit that it almost became competitive you know comparing other people's gifts he said in first corinthians 13 i may have all these gifts and i may be able to prophesy and i may be able to work out all mysteries but if i don't have love then it's like a sounding gong and it's worth nothing so you know the first and the second commandments sum up everything love the lord your god with all your heart soul strength and mind and love your neighbor as yourselves and may, and 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 by the way sometimes we don't need to get so spiritual that we're always looking for a spiritual look. sometimes we just need to be practical if we see a situation in front of us you know a, a dear old lady that can't carry her grocery bags because they're too heavy we don't need the holy spirit to move on us to help her we just use practical common sense and like the parable of the Good Samaritan, you know, the, the priest and the Levite, everyone, they were very gifted. They had a calling. They had a talent. But what did they do? They stayed on the other side of the road because they didn't want to go out of their comfort zone. But who comes along? a Samaritan, an enemy of the Israelites. And what did he do? He crossed the road. He helped with the, with the wounds of the man. He took him. He paid a price to look after that man. And then he said, I'll come back and check out on you. Guys, this is a picture of our Lord. He's the good Samaritan. He goes out of the comfort zone. He came out of the comfort zone. He took upon himself on the cross. That was an act of love. I'm sure he didn't feel all lovey-dovey when he was being nailed on the cross. There is sacrifice. And with our gifts and with our talents, may we rise up. May we rise up as an army. And guys, not just living in this life to survive. We want to not always be fighting for survival on the defense we want to rise up we want to go on the offense we want to make an impact and this is how the church is going to survive in the last days because there's going to be more and more darkness more and more attack on the church and we got to know who we are we got to know the keys
that the Lord has given us, not just the word of God, which is the sword of the spirit, but our gifts and our talents. And God can, the Holy Spirit can come upon us at any given moment. And we can use these gifts and make a, a massive impact like Joseph when he was in prison. He didn't know what was around the corner, but look what happened. And uh, let us not be competitive and look at other gifts. Let us be thankful with even the one talent that we have got and let us go and put it to use for the master's uh, good and for the building up of his kingdom. Thank you. Amen. Um, if you want to unmute yourself and uh, John, I'm going to, I normally say over to you, Liz, but uh, maybe I'll hand it over to you if you want to unmute. Here, yeah, let me unmute you. No. Why is that not unmuting? Huh. Maybe I need to find a... something here. This is where we need uh, Liz. <laughs> uh, if anyone knows what to do, send me a, uh, a message on the, here we go, mute. Um, audio settings, here we go. Um, I think individuals can unmute uh, themselves. Uh, here we go. Great. Thanks, Paul. Did you hear that, everyone? You can unmute yourself. I can't do it from here for some reason. John, do you know how to do that yourself? Huh. I'm John. Anyway, if anyone's got, uh, in the meantime, while we're, um, hmm, if anyone's got any thoughts, I'm trying to find, here we go, mute, audio settings. Um, there should be, a, people should have a microphone on the bottom left corner of their oh, yeah. screen that if you, if there's a uh, red Who's line. the only one? Can somebody out. else? Can somebody else try to unmute yourself and say something? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah. Unmute. it's okay. Okay, John, John, thank you for that. Okay, so uh, we can. John Dettel, you should be able to find that. Okay, well, there's a few comments here uh, before I read them. Does anybody want to say something or respond or if anyone has a question? And if I don't one of the know, things that I've will... seen, no, one of the things that I've seen in the church is that everybody, uh, when, when you get a leader, the leader tries to make them like themselves instead of identifying their gifts and building the gifts. And as a result, there are churches that have a very strong component, but lots of weaknesses. And um, I, I did a posting a while back uh, when I was doing 10 days of prayer one time. A woman from India said that uh, our children call him the God of the ice cream. And I saw one of the picture of these ice cream trucks that come around and they got all kinds of different ice cream treats. And, and my concept was he's the God of the ice cream, not the God of the cookie butter. <laughs> That's good. I like that uh, analogy. Thank you, Paul. That's good. I, uh, Haran, I got, okay. Yeah, we can see you and hear you. And uh, good to have you with us. Any other comment? I was able to get in on the uh, my phone and for some reason, my computer is not uh, reacting properly. Mm. Um, you, you know, it's interesting that you started off the conversation speaking about that doctor. Um, and could you just mention a little bit more about what he had, 
in his book about connecting because it very interestingly Liz and I are you know kicking around a you know possibility for a name for our ministry you know and one of the names we had come up with is uh connection or or connecting ministries and and uh really? so that that's so well, I, let, me, let me let me give you an illustration everyone it's a really powerful anecdote illustration of what he's trying to talk about in his book he gives a story of a young man when he was the chaplain at the university he counseled a young man who was having some really difficult emotional, psychological problems. And he spent hour after hour after hour counseling this young man. <clears throat> uh, during that three years at that college, one day that young man was sitting in the grounds of the college with a few of his friends sitting on the grass, uh, talking, talking away. And Dr. Crabb comes walking by and he sees this young man with his friends. And he's got his blazer over his shoulder and his, heart, his tie halfway down his shirt. It's after hours. And he, and he goes and he sees the young man. And he says, hey, uh, you know, Chuck or whatever his name was. And he goes and he sits down with them. He says, how are you doing? And, and these are your friends. And, they, and he ends up staying, I think it was a, an hour or so talking with this young man and, and all of his friends. And that was it. Some years later, quite a few years later, I can't remember, maybe 10 years or something later, Dr. Crabb gets a letter from that young man. And that young man said to him, you know, uh, Dr. Crabb, he said, um, just want you to know I'm, I'm married now. I've got a fantastic job. I've been promoted. I've got my own house. Things are successful. But he said, I want to uh, firstly thank God, but also thank you for the time and the effort that you spent with me. But he said, while I appreciated those hours in your office, he said, the thing, if I could look back in my life, the moment that there was a change in my life, it wasn't those hours that I was in your office. He said, when I was sitting on that grass with my friends and I see the big Dr. Larry Crabb walking along and that big Dr. Larry Crabb comes and sits down with me, with my friends and spends an hour talking with us. He said, you got no idea what that meant to me. And how big I felt and how important and how valued I felt. And that's one really, I, I remember that story that he told. And he was talking about that, uh, the, the concept of connecting. And he actually counters, and it's, I think it's similar to what you were saying, Paul, this kind of leadership that believes they've got a high calling from the heavens. And, um, you know, that passage that we read in Romans 12, he said, don't think more highly of yourself, you know? And sometimes people get these, these positions of authority and pride can come in. And because of that pride, there's a gap, there's a disconnection because it, um, it's, that pride becomes a barrier between the leadership and the, the lay. Whereas, um, and, and think of, in the light of that story, think of the Lord when he washed the disciples' feet, uh, which was the, the, the role of a servant. And uh, that's why the disciples were kind of offended. Lord, what are you doing? And he said, what I'm doing now, you don't understand now, but later you will understand. So um, uh, we can't obviously go into it all now. John, but uh, that story, I hope, gives you kind of an, a, a picture, an idea of, of uh, you know, what it means to connect and um, not to have this wrong concept of leadership, that just because I have a position of leadership or a, or a call from God doesn't make me, doesn't set me apart 
where I'm bigger and more holier and I've got, you know, and, and whether my gift or my gift to speak in front of people makes me better than you, not to forget. Um, you know, another story that comes to my mind, Richard Wormbrand, you know, who Richard Wormbrand was, yes. uh, voice, voice to the Martyrs. There's a story that he was invited in Romania to speak to thousands in this church. And when he was on his way to the church, he arrives in the car, they open the door, they, they escort him up the stairs thousands of people waiting in the church and while he's walking up the stairs there's this beggar on the stairs and Richard Wormbrandt stops and he starts to talk to the man and he's talking for a minute or so and his escort say we need to go Mr. Wormbrandt he said well you know what he said I, I actually just want to stay and talk with this man for a little bit and uh, so he actually sat down and he continued talking to the man few minutes later the escort said uh, we're about to start the service he says no no i i, I really want to talk and carry on talking and um you know what happened richard wormbrand didn't go into that church he was the guest speaker and he didn't go in he wanted to speak to that one man he wanted to minister to that one man that's a, a, a an incredible story the humility of that man, of course, that humility, you know, comes with living three years in solitary confinement and another 13 years living in a rat infested prison. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, he connected with that man that was so uh, low in the, in, the, um, in the ladder of social, uh, you know, acceptance and, and honor, but not to Richard Wormbrand. He he had different eyes. Yeah. Any that's, other comments, anyone? That's a beautiful story about Wormbrand, brother. And I could just see how he identified because that man, that beggar, was in, even though he was physically in society, he was in prison. He, he was a prisoner and God has called us to set the prisoners free. Yes. And you know, you know, you know what spoke to me also when you when you spoke about the greeters in a church, I think it's a ministry that is really being overlooked today. It's not happening the way God is calling it to be. You know, we're you know, you know people, there's such a difference, I think, when a person is welcomed and you could feel the passion in the person's heart who is in who is you know, hugging you, maybe a lot of people are upset because of the hugging part of it. I happen to be a hugger. So, and I think, uh, I know Paul is, and, and a few of us on this call are, and, and you know what? There's such a uh, uh, impartation of, of love when you hug someone with sincerity and, yeah. and the love of Christ. There's such a divine connection. Yeah. And, you know, and I believe if that's done more, it's going to really impact the church. And again, it's a in a way it's washing a person's feet when you when you welcome him because you you're acting like a servant, like someone greeting someone into a, you know, a, a, a hall or a, a castle or whatever the case may be the the servants that had to do that uh, job. And, and, and you know, John. John, the other thing about hugs and things like that is it can break down walls, walls of fear, yeah. walls of insecurity. And, and I remember, you know, that was one of your qualities when I first met you. Uh, you know, you're, you're very warm and it really does break down those walls. Remember when we were on the beach in, uh, uh, along the Mediterranean, we stayed at, overnight at that hotel and we yep. had a couple of sessions there, yep. and uh, you, you know, you you have a real gift in 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 breaking down those walls with people. Yeah, you, know, you know, interesting is because I really believe, and I and I and I do do that a lot, particularly with men. I pray a father's blessing over them. You know, being of that age, I I you know I'm able to say I'm older than you. So. Let me pray, Father's blessing, and I and and I could 
people have told me about the impact it's had on their on their hearts and on their lives because so many men in particular and women too have have not had the father's love i mean and, and you know i didn't have it growing up my dad was an alcoholic i don't remember him ever telling me he loved me you know and and uh but i just even this morning in prayer you know just such a beautiful association with with abba with with adonai or elohim like father you know god that he wants us to be imparters of his love because it's so absent and and neglected in people's lives you, you know they, they oh by the way one other comment i had was about you were talking about the keys uh you know the keys to the kingdom and what you didn't and i was waiting for you to say it but the keys open doors the keys open doors again to people's hearts to people's minds and the gifts of the holy spirit you know they are keys and they're and and god wants us not only to carry the keys but to use utilize them the way he's calling us and you had mentioned how and 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 where and why uh, but, but yeah, at the keys open the doors, uh, you know, we keep talking about doors and people's eyes, opening doors and closing doors. But when God gives us those gifts of the keys to utilize, we have to use them properly, Lord God, you know, with prayer and, and, and the Holy Spirit guidance, and, you know, I think it's so critical and it's, you were right on with that. And, uh, so oh, it's. But thank you, brother, for your, again, uh, a beautiful teaching. Uh, and I guess some people are mixed up or something. I, I, and I was having computer problems like, with my computer, but I was able to jury rig and get on here. But, but uh, oh, again, really? we, need, we, we need my partner in crime here, the, the, our technical expert. <laughs> yeah. You and, and I don't have a gift so much in technical stuff, but your wife obviously does. So, yeah. <laughs> really does she's so gifted and not only that in so many other ways and and uh, she's right. just a special woman of god but uh and, and gina gina is still hit and miss right right now uh, yeah not sure not sure where she's at um yeah i think someone else might want is someone else waiting to comment uh just unmute yourself if you'd like to uh, can you hear me this is mitch from pennsylvania Hey, Mitch. Hi. Um, I still don't have a camera, but the uh, new computer has a microphone. Uh, I was thinking how you teach and explain to us the meanings of the Hebrew words, somebody's name, a place name, and what we get out of that. And I thought of how Adam named the animals by noticing their different attributes and then called them by a name that distinguished them from another animal. But it made me think of the Hebrew word for zoo, the literal translation, which I think is a beautiful thing, gan chayot, which means garden of animals. And I just love that. Like you hear the word zoo, but you hear the Hebrew, it means garden of animals. And there's so much to be found in God's word that way. So I really appreciate those things you bring out to us. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Mitch. Yeah. Yeah, the Gan Chayot, exactly, the Garden of Animals. And yeah, where do they get the word zoo? I guess it's a, what, Greek word? I don't know if anyone can find out where the, what, what the etymology of zoo uh, is, probably, or Latin, Latin or Greek. But uh, yeah, thanks for that, Mitch. <laughs> it, it, you know, Grant, there was another thing. I saw an advertisement um, yesterday about a Bible. I don't know if this is a, scam or whatever they're talking about half off and talking about some kind of hebrew bible that's going to really help us and i and i can't look at it right now because i'm afraid to lose the connection here <laughs> uh do you know uh, are you aware of that you know because we're talking about um you know trying to to to, to get more hebrew words and and this supposedly is supposed to help in that area and i don't know if it's legit or not i don't know if you're aware of it no, I'm not aware of it at all. Uh, I'll, I'll try to find the advertisement and send it to you because they're saying it's like 50% off. And then I was reading through some of the comments and somebody said it takes you months to get it or whatever. 
and uh, it's Israel 365 or something like that. Um, but I'll, I'll find it and I'll send it to you because it, it sounds like something that, you know, we've all been talking about trying to, to, to learn more Hebrew words and their translations. And, and it, it sounds like that would be on the right pathway, but I just want to make sure it's legitimate. Right. You know, it could help Definitely. us. Send me some information. Um, I'm just looking at the chats. One of them, Don, uh, is asking about um, Matthew 25, 30, where you will be thrown out into the darkness. And the question is at the outer, outside the kingdom warning. So I've, I've read a few commentaries on that phrase and to the out of darkness, where there is uh, weeping and gnashing of teeth. And a lot of Christians interpret that as being hell. Okay. But most scholars say it's nothing to do with hell. It's actually, it's a place of regret. That's what they would uh, Using that terminology in the Greek mindset, because remember, 2,000 years ago, even though it was a Jewish world, it was still very much a Greco-Roman world. And uh, if you look at a, a lot of the parables about roads and about streets and about um, uh, uh, a lot of those things come from the Roman world. The Romans were fantastic builders. And a lot of the terminology used in the New Testament is written with to people who had a, a Greco-Roman cultural so, so, uh, uh, sociological background. And that is what most scholars say. So the answer, I don't think it's a, a sense of losing salvation. I think it's just a, it's, he's saying there will be regret when, when the... Um, when the man comes for the day of reckon, reckoning, the Lord returns, uh, there'll be regret. There'll be uh, sorrow and, and mourning. I think a lot of verses uh, that people use uh, for, you know, losing salvation, most of those verses, uh, they don't mean losing salvation at all. That's my understanding. So, Given that we were talking about the kingdom, in this passage, and this is a parable of the kingdom, I wouldn't expect there to be found regret when you're when we're in the kingdom. And so that was kind of the uh, reason for the question. I'm happy well, with the answer. Pardon? Yeah. I'm happy yeah. with the answer, but it was it just yeah. seemed uh, right no, because question. and that and that matches with um that matches with other verses as well because there, there is one uh, other parable where the Lord talks about, uh, so where he talks about the doctrine of rewards and punishment, where people will get rewarded and people will get beaten. He actually uses the term getting beaten. And I'm not sure, that one, I'm not sure what that means. Um, but certainly regret may, may be, you know, even one of the disciplines when David counted the people, the Lord said to him, you choose what uh, discipline you want. And one of the, the choices was uh, the beatings of man. And that, and that was not physically beaten. That was what people say, what people talk about. That's, like, that's sometimes a worse beating when people talk and say bad things about you. So, yeah, one, it, it's a study in itself, a lot of the biblical literature. We have to be so careful that we don't read into it from our 21st century Western mindset. I've got a good friend. He's actually a, a messianic believer here in Israel. He's also a tour guide. He did a seven-year doctorate on, um, on biblical literature. And uh, having a conversation with him was like, it was like he just, he, he was in a different planet someday. Some of the things that he would bring out and I was kind of a little jealous because I it just lit a fire in me. I wanted to learn some of the things. Um, but that Bible that I co constantly refer to, which I actually have in my hands, um, it's the, uh, the, what does that say? The um, cultural. NIV Cultural Background uh, Study Bible. 
this Bible, a lot goes into the literature. In other words, in the commentaries, there'll be lots of comments that they will say, this is what it meant in that particular uh, world. And it's quite often totally different to how we interpret it today. You know, Aharon, this brings up a really interesting subject because, you know, having been in the Catholic Church, you know, most of my life, I, I uh, uh, one of the things they talk about uh, in, in I went hey, to Tom, by the way, by the way, your camera's off. If you want to be seen. Oh, camera... right. Yeah. Okay. Here I am. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, so I was in Catholic, I went to Catholic schools for, for 12 years, three of those years were like in a Ukrainian Catholic seminary. And not that I was a seminarian, but I took the same class anyway. Um, so I, I was imbued in with, with a lot of teachings in the Catholic church. One of them um, among them being the whole idea of purgatory. And, you know, and a lot of people refute that. I still, in the back of my mind, wonder about this. I, I had my closest friend and prayer partner for over 40 years. He passed away two days after Christmas. And he was really deep. He was 89 when he passed away. And he, and he, and he had actually had been in seminary for a few years. And we talked about purgatory. And, uh, you know, people talk about purgatory being a place of fire and pain and suffering. That, that you are purged of any remains of sin. Not, in other words, not mortal sin, but if, if, if you have remains of sin. And you know, all of us, most of us, I think, um, uh, sometimes think that maybe we haven't totally forgiven someone or we, you know, maybe we stole something when we were kids and we didn't make reparation or whatever the case may be. Different things that we have done in our lives. And I did a lot of, wrong things I, I i confess to that um but what what he came up with and 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 he prayed a great deal he was you know incredible prayer and he and he was separated for his wife for many years but we were extremely close i mean he's definitely closer than a brother and what he always had the sense that god showed him was that purgatory that there is a purgatory but it, it is a, a place of learning and not burning, he said. That's what he came. He came up with the term learning and not burning, you know, because, you know, we talk about heaven. There is no nothing unholy in heaven. There's only holiness in heaven, right. you know, and if we have any remains of sin, say, when we pass away. We don't know the time of our death and maybe we've just done something wrong. Maybe we just, just a second before we die or 10 seconds before we die, we did something wrong and we haven't repented. Right. You know, it, it certainly is, you talk about your friend with the seven years, that's something I would love for you to lay at his feet and talk about what I'm just bringing up here. Because yeah. you know what, it, to me, it makes sense. Yeah. We may not like to hear that. We may not like to hear that. But to me, it's logical. And, and, you know, God gives us logic and he gives us intelligence to, you know, to seek the word of God and, and to and to meditate on it and, and to seek after his way and his truth. And if there is something that is. If that's feasible and possible, it is something that we should consider doing more repenting. <laughs> Yeah, that's good yeah. logic, John. Good logic. Yeah. Guys, the time is ticking away. And can I just open it up if anyone has any last comment or question, please? And uh, if not, we will close in prayer. All right, well, let me first, um, when am I supposed to stop the recording? I think after the prayer. So guys, let's close in a word of prayer. Let's commit what we learned and, and uh, this word to the Lord. Father God, we thank you for this um, reminder in your word and the importance uh, of how you have entrusted us with gifts, with talents, with natural ability. And Lord, we don't wanna just fight 
for our survival. We want to make an impact. We want to uh, invest in, in this world where you've placed us, uh, our gifts and our talents. We ask, Lord, that you give us wisdom in these days to know when and when not to speak, when and when not to use our gifts, our talents, when and when not to go out on a limb and, uh, and to be open to you leading us in new ways as your Holy Spirit imparts to us. Lord, I pray your blessing on everyone that we walk in the fullness of the Spirit. Lord, that we would um, all have a you know, reasonably good idea or that you would continue to show us uh, what are our real gifts and what are our talents. But Lord, above all things, like Paul says, that uh, love, love is the greatest. And may we walk in love. May we walk in humility. May we follow the example of our Lord. May we follow the example of Paul, of Richard Wormbrandt, of Dr. Larry Crabb, of the Good Samaritan. These good stories, Lord, that give us a picture of what it's like. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you especially for Yeshua, Jesus, who came. You froze, brother. Who binds up our wounds, who heals our broken heart, who pays a price for our upkeep. We thank you, Lord. We bless you. I pray your blessing on everyone here, Lord. Adonai, v'yishmarecha, ya'e Adonai panavalecha, v'yichonecha, isa Adonai panavalecha, v'yasimlecha, shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you shalom, peace. In his precious name, amen. 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 Shabbat shalom all. Shabbat shalom. God bless you all, our brothers and sisters. Paul, Paul, what was that? See you all next week. Yeah, yes. everyone, bless you. Love to you all. Love Happy. you. Happy uh, Feast of Tabernacle, Sukkot, yes. and yes. rejoice. Pardon? Hag Sameach. Hag Sameach. Yes, thank you. Bless you. Shabbat shalom. Oh, I better, I better, um, I better stop the uh, uh, recording. Here we go.